Good morning, good morning, good morning, Carmel Assembly. How are y'all doing this morning? Y'all sound mighty quiet. Good morning, how y'all doing? Good, 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 good. Okay, I just want to let y'all know I'm a little out of breath right now. I'm so out of shape. Have y'all ever tried to go up and down them steps on the side? It is rough. Now that one out front ain't, ain't as bad, but these on the side are rough. I got to start doing something. I'm, I'm out of shape. <laughs> Well, come on and stand with us this morning. We're going to pray, and then we're going to get started. We're going to worship God this morning. Is that all right? Lord, we thank you for the day, God. We thank you for, for allowing us to come out to your house this morning. God, we thank you for uh, being in our lives. God, we thank you for being who you are, God. We thank you for being love. God, we're going to praise you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
My 
says that we love him because he first loved us. God is love. He's the author of love. He's the essence of love. Everything about him is love. Could you just thank the Lord for his love right now in your own way? Father, we thank you for the love of God. Lord, your word tells us that you so love this world that you gave your only begotten son that whosoever would believe in you should not perish but have everlasting life. You love us with an unending love. You love us with a sacrificial love. You love us with a love that just keeps on and keeps on and keeps on loving. And we praise you for that today. And we thank you for that today. And our hope is based on that today, Lord. We welcome you in this place. We invite you in this place. We want to go to the Lord in prayer. If you have a need this morning, uh, God certainly knows all about it. Would you just raise your hand and say, I have a need that God is aware of and I need him to help me with it. I need him to intervene in my life. Um, a number of needs connected to our church family. Could we just pray and go before the Lord and take needs before him this morning? Father, we do thank you for this awesome privilege of being in your house. God, we thank you for your love today. We thank you for your mercy and grace, your Holy Spirit that ministers to our lives, God. You're aware of our needs. You know what we have need of even before we ask. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would minister help and encouragement and grace and mercy, peace and salvation and blessing and strength today. Lord, I lift up John and Christy King. I lift up Rhonda Skipper. Lord, I lift up those that are hurting today, those that have needs, Father, financially, physically, spiritually, whatever the need is, God, you're able today. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would minister, that you would touch us today. God, meet needs in this house, we pray, and we'll thank you. We'll praise you. We'll magnify your name for that in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to pick up where we left off. Uh, Sunday was uh, two weeks ago when we started on this little blind man by the side of the road. We left him by the side of the road. We don't want to leave him there. We want to pick him up and uh, get going with him again. So John chapter 9. John chapter 9. Uh, follow along on the screen. It's no longer turning your Bibles to, it's follow along on the screen or your iPhone or whatever. <clears throat> John chapter 9 verse 1, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth and his disciples asked him saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. The first message that we preached with this uh, little thought was uh, two weeks ago when we had three simple points. Number one was Jesus always has time for someone in need. If you remember the story, uh, Jesus had been in the synagogue. Uh, the rulers and uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and even the Jews were upset with Jesus and they picked up stones to stone him to death. Jesus slips out through the crowd, is going away, gets right down the road and bam, he walks up on a blind man, uh, doesn't even consider the fact that there's a mob of people behind him wanting to kill him. Jesus is drawn to this blind man and says, that man needs me, I have time for him. Uh, Jesus always has time for someone in need. You and I are so busy with our lives, we pass people by every day, but Jesus always has time for someone in need. And then our second point was everything changes when Jesus passes by. 
Nothing ever stays the same once Jesus has been involved in it. So Jesus passed by this man. And once we read on in the story, a few Sundays from now, you will find out that he, don't, he doesn't stay there as a blind man, but he receives his sight. And then the very fact that the scripture says he saw a man. Uh, Jesus took the time to focus on this individual. Again, there's a mob wanting to kill him. He takes the time to see him. How many people do you and I overlook in a weekly basis, on a weekly basis, people that God puts in our path, people with needs, and we're so busy living our life, busy doing our thing, busy working, busy going to school, busy with the children, busy with the job, busy with the chores. We don't even see people that are right there beside us by the side of the road in need. That was the last message. We want to pick up today about being blind from birth. Blind from birth. Uh, the tragedy of being blind from birth. How many of you have ever heard the name Helen Keller? Chipola College did a play about her uh, last year, I believe it was. Kim and I went over on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, those students did an awesome job depicting that young Helen Keller. When she was 19 months old, she had, they don't know if it was ru uh, rheumatic fever, rheumatoid fever, whatever, she had a terrible fever that uh, left her blind and, and deaf. She could no longer see, she could not hear as a 19 month old. Uh, I remember we had uh, years ago, many years ago, uh, for senior adult day here, we had a brother Roland Blunt who was blind. Uh, he was an Assemblies of God missionary. He and his wife, uh, missionaries to the blind, actually. And Brother Roland had a similar fever that uh, Helen Keller had when he was a small child, and it, it took one of his eyes. So he had one eye uh, that was good. And as a small child, he and his friend, his buddy, were out playing in the road, uh, by the road one day, and his buddy picked up a rock and threw it. And would you know it, that it hit Brother Blunt's good eye, and he was blind in both eyes then. And I remember uh, his wife was such a beautiful lady. Uh, she was in her 70s at that time, a uh, later 70s, but she was a beautiful lady. And we went to uh, Grady's to eat shrimp with them one, on a Saturday night. And I remember saying to Brother Blunt, I said, man, I feel sorry for you. He said, why? Uh, he, he was a phenomenal individual, just a precious gem of a person. And I remember him saying that he would read three to four books a week. <laughs> I thought, you don't have either eye, and you're reading Braille three to four books a week, and I have two good eyes, and I don't read a book a week. That was back then. But I remember he said, why do you feel sorry for me? I said, you have never seen how beautiful your wife is. And the, the thought of that hit me. I'm like, you've never seen what this woman that you're married to looks like. And uh, he said, oh, he said, I know, Brother Jerry. He said, but I take my hand and I rub it on her face. And I'll go around her chin and I'll do. He said, and I can tell how beautiful she is. I said, well, I just want to be. <laughs> I said, I'm not trying to steal your wife here. I said, but I just want you to know she's a beautiful lady. And man, when you get to heaven and your eyes are open, you're going to realize you were married to a beautiful lady on this earth. But the tragedy of being born blind. We had uh, Brother Gene Jackson. Many of you won't even, that name won't even ring a bell with you. He used to be a district superintendent for the Assemblies of God in the state of Tennessee. And he, ha he and his wife had a baby girl uh, born to them and uh, looked like a normal, healthy child to begin with. And as the weeks went by and the months went by, they began to notice that she would not follow with her eyes. She wouldn't focus in with her eyes on anyone, wouldn't respond, you know, like a baby would to the direction someone's talking or something going on. And they became obviously concerned, took her to the pediatrician. Sure enough, she was born blind. Uh, Brother Jackson was a powerful man of God. He had seen miracles in his ministry. He had seen the power of God work in people's lives and seen the miraculous take place. And so he set out to fasting and praying. He, he just knew that God was going to respond to his pleas for his daughter's eyesight, as any father would. Uh, he, he set out to on a fast, and he fasted for many, many days. And I remember him telling about he was shut up in the church on a Friday night, and he had spent all night long in that church pl praying, pleading with God, God, let my daughter see. Give, my, give vision to my daughter. And it was way on over in the early morning hours. He said the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, This is for my glory. 
And so that settled it in his heart. He knew that his daughter was going to be blind. And she's a, a full-grown lady today. Obviously, she's probably in her 60s, 50 or 60s. Has lived a very independent life. Uh, lives in an apartment by herself. Functions on her own. Cooks for herself. And that just blows my mind. I've picked on Allison for the last few Sundays. Allison right here on this front row, she's blind. And can't see anything. Totally, totally blind. And uh, so... Can you just imagine being born blind? That's a horrible thought. But this man was blind. He was blind from birth. But you know, there are two kinds of sight. There's physical sight that you and I, most everyone with the exception of Allison, can look around this room and we can see the paint on the wall. We can see the screen up here, the stained glass. We can see the writing compel the faces of different nations over here. We can see with our physical eyes. But there's also another sight and that is a spiritual sight. And there can I tell us this morning, there are many people that have two eyes, but they're spiritually blind. They cannot see. They cannot see. There are two kinds of sight. There are two kinds of birth. There's a natural birth. Every one of us in this room obviously were born to a set of parents at some, at some point. We had a natural physical birth. But there's also a spiritual birth that must take place for spiritual eyes to be opened. As again, as I've already said, there are many people going through life. They're living, they're breathing, their heart is beating, they're taking a breath into their lungs, but spiritually they cannot see. You know why this world is such a chaotic place? You know why America seems to be falling apart at the seams and there's riots on the streets and there's destruction in towns and people's lives are in danger? Because people cannot see what they are doing. They're blind. They're spiritually blind. John uh, chapter 3 and verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. Nobody can do these miracles unless you come from God. We know that. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Notice this, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And if you know the story, you know this through Nicodemus for a loop. He didn't have a clue what Jesus was talking about. He said, man, how can an old man be born again? There's no way he can go back into his mother's womb. But Jesus equated this spiritual birth with this ability to see spiritually as well. He said, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So there must be a new birth for there to be spiritual eyesight to be able to see. John was speaking of Jesus in John chapter 1 verse 11. said, as he came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right or the power to become the children of God to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Again, They're born naturally, obviously they have to be, but then there's a spiritual birth that takes place. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. We saw His glory. Why? Because we experienced that new birth that came. We had a new vision. We had a new birth. Our world totally changed. We saw everything differently then. 1 Peter says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Hear me this morning. Church is not about you becoming a good moral person. Does that blow your mind today? (laughs) Now, we're supposed to be good morally. I understand that. We're supposed to be good moral people, good values, family values, good morals. But church is not supposed to just make you a good person. We've got to be born again. We've got to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I can go through the doors of a church every day of the week and it won't affect me. It won't make me any different than than I am. (laughs) You know, it doesn't have any effect whatsoever. I must have a born-again experience with Jesus Christ for my eyes to be open and for me to see the way God intended me to see. You ever heard the song, 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was what? I was blind. I couldn't see. But now I see. I was blind, but now I see. That new birth, that accepting Christ. Again, there's, you know, I'm, I thank you for coming to church. It would be pointless to be up here if there wasn't people out there uh, in the pews. But coming to church, <sighs> It's nothing. You've got to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, be born again, and then you see. The tragedy of being blind from birth. We have a world full of people that are blind because they've never experienced the new birth. They've never experienced a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ. You might be sitting in this building today, and I would venture to say that some are. You come to this building, you like Anthony singing, you like the worship team, you like being around other people, but man, you're missing the whole point if you've not been born again. If you've not had a life-changing encounter with a living Christ, you may not hear uh, lightning, you may not see lightning flash or hear thunder, but when you honestly in your heart, wherever you are, kneel down and say, Jesus, come into my life, change me Give me a new beginning, a new start. When you're honest with God, God will get honest with you, and God will radically change your life. Put him to the test and see. So the tragedy of being blind from birth. Many, 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 many people in the world are blind, spiritually blind, because they have not had a new birth. Verse number 2. His disciples ask him, saying, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned? Somebody has to be at fault here. We like, we like blaming people, don't we? We like to find somebody so we can put, put the blame on them. And that's what the disciples were doing here. They said, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? One of them have got to be the issue here. One of these people have got to be the problem here. And uh, so my second point is, who's at fault? Who's at fault here? Why is this man blind? Uh, I didn't realize this until I started studying the different commentaries about this verse right here. And the commentary said that many Jews believed without any scriptural foundation whatsoever, but many Jews believed that this man possibly sinned in a pre-existent state. (laughs) He sinned before he came to this life. And that's the reason his sin followed him and he's paying for it in this life. That is not Bible. That is not biblical. We don't believe like that. But that's what these guys were thinking. And Jesus' response to the disciples' question is found in verse 3. But I want to look at this from a little different angle. The disciples were obviously asking Jesus about his physical condition of being blind. He could not see. He had to be led around. He had to have someone to help him. He he couldn't uh, carry on like other people in society. But who is at fault and why are there so many spiritually blind people in the world today? Why are so many masses of people who have eyes but they cannot see? Well, the scripture says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, the apostle Paul said... Just as through one man sin entered the world. Who was that one man that sin entered the world through? Adam. The first creation. God made Adam and Eve, placed them in that garden. They were a perfect creation of God. They had God's image in their life. They were morally upright. They lived in a perfect world, a perfect garden of Eden. And they wanted that forbidden fruit that God said, that one tree, don't touch it. How many of you know? (laughs) How many of you are parents in the house, and when you say, don't do that, what's going to happen? That's what they're going to do. And for some reason, we're kind of drawn to forbidden fruit. (laughs) Oh, you might as well go ahead and admit it. (laughs) The Bible (laughs) points it out. And so Adam and Eve fell in that garden. Sin entered the world. Sin entered the human race. And in 2020, thousands of years out from Adam and Eve, guess what? We're still paying the price for our first parents' sin. So who sinned that there are so many blind people in the world today? Well, we could blame Adam and Eve for starters. 
it, it traces back to them. It goes right back to them. Once they uh, broke the command of God and took that forbidden fruit, bam, a blindness came over eyes. And the scripture says, Through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. So we have to have a Savior. We have to be born again. Um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3, Paul also talks about blindness. He said, if our gospel is veiled, or if it's hidden, if it's covered, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has what? The God of this age has blinded the minds of people. Who's the God of this age? Satan, the devil, Lucifer. He has blinded the minds of people. They cannot see their need. You know why people do the crazy things they do? You know why people get drunk? You know why people get stoned out on drugs? You know why people kill? You know why people murder? You know why people riot and burn down buildings and loot buildings and do all these crazy, horrible things that's going on? Because they cannot see what they're doing. They're blind. And a blind person cannot see what they are doing. And the Bible says very plainly in black and white, the God of this world has blinded the minds of people. Blind people can't see where they're going, can't see what they're doing, can't see the destruction they bring on themselves. Paul also addressing this similar thing in Ephesians says, He made you alive. We were at one time dead. That's not talking about a physical death. We were spiritually dead inside. And we had to have Jesus Christ to resurrect our spirit. It says, You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The prince of the power of the air. Again, who is that? The devil. Satan. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. He says that spirit is at work in people who do not know God. Why is the world such a chaotic place today? Because that spirit is at work in people who do not know Christ, that are blinded, that have never had a spiritual rebirth, that have never had spiritual vision to be able to see their need of God and their need of the Word of God and the Spirit of God in their life. Jesus was addressing his disciples in John chapter 14. He said, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. Say, wait a minute, Brother Jerry, I thought Jesus was the ruler of the world. He will be one day. (laughs) And the government will be upon his shoulders one day. Everything will rest on him one day. But I think we can look around the world today and realize Jesus is not ruling this earth right now. It wouldn't be the crazy, chaotic place that it is if he was. But one day in the future, it's all pointing to that millennial reign where he will rule on this earth and his laws will be carried out in the land. He said, the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. He has no part of me. He he doesn't want anything to do with me. We're polar opposites. He was talking about the devil. He said he's going to rule this world to an extent and he rules through people's lives Ephesians 6 and 12 we do not wrestle against flesh and blood my war is not a battle that I can go up and punch somebody in the face with but we wrestle against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places remember my my point is whose fault is it Jesus was a The disciples were dealing with a man who was physically blind, but realizing that we have a world full of spiritually blind people, whose fault is it that there are so many spiritually blind people in the world? Why are there so many spiritually blind people that cannot see destruction, that cannot see their need of a Savior, that cannot see what they're doing to their lives? Why are there so many spiritually blind people Could it be our fault? 
Could it be the church's fault? Could it be that we have dropped the ball? Could it be that we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing to show people the light, the Savior, the Son of God? Jesus said, my mission is to come and seek and save the lost. In Isaiah chapter 42, the Holy Spirit came over the prophet Isaiah and he said this concerning the coming Messiah, Jesus, who was yet to come hundreds of years later. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes. Isaiah said the mission of Jesus Christ will be to open blinded eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. And then Jesus basically quoted that verse in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, when he was, when he was in the synagogue and he was handed that scroll and he began reading, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Whose fault is it that there are so many blind people in the world today? Could I say that the ball rests in our court this morning? As the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have an obligation to a world that is blinded, that cannot see, that have lost their way, that do not know the path they're going down. We have an obligation to show them Christ. We have an obligation to tell them Christ. We have an obligation to share the gospel. How many people have you shared Jesus with this week? I don't think I've shared him with anybody this week. And I'm a paid preacher. How many people have you let out of darkness into light this week? We're good at telling people about the ball games, and we're good at telling people about this and that. Uh, we're good at talking about our work. We're good at talking about going fishing. We're good at talking about hunting. We're good at talking about killing the big buck and catching the big bass. We're good at talking about our favorite hobbies. We're good at all this. But when it comes to sharing faith with somebody who's blind, it's like, hmm. Whose fault is it that there's so many blind people today? Jesus said the church is the light of the world. A city set on a hill. He's not talking about this building. He's talking about people who know him in relationship with him. Whose fault is it? I realize that's a little heavy. Whose fault is it that there are so many blind in the world today? Let's move on to verse 3. They ask, whose fault is it? This guy is his parents. Who did the sin here that he's, he's reaping from it? Verse 3, Jesus answered them, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. He said, Nobody's at fault. It's not a sin issue. I know year, years, 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 years ago, there used to be a teaching that if you had anything wrong with you, there must be sin in your life. If you were sick, oh, you've got, to, you've got to confess the sin out of your life. That's, that's hogwash. That is, that is <laughs> there's, there's no truth to that. There's nothing biblical about that. So Jesus said, you know, nobody sinned here. It's that the works of God should be revealed in him. Can I tell us that we were created for divine revelation? I said we were created for divine revelation. What do you mean, Brother Jerry? I don't mean... Well, Jesus reveals himself to us. We give our heart and life to him. He's the Savior. He's the Lord of our life. But then he commissions us to go and represent him to a world that is lost. He empowers us by his Holy Spirit and says, now you go to that person that's blind and you reveal Christ to them. How do you do that? Through your actions, through your love, through your attitude, through your life, through your witness, through your testimony, through how you live your life, representing Christ on this earth. You are Christ, <laughs> can I say this without distorting it? You're Christ in the flesh on this earth if he lives in your life and flows through your life. You're his representative on this earth. 
and you were created that the works of God could be revealed through your life. The works of the Lord could be revealed in your life, through your life, to people in need. Just like this blind man. Jesus said it wasn't anybody's fault. He was created for a purpose. You were created for a purpose. Has God done anything for you today? Has God done anything in your life worth sharing with someone else? Jesus said the gospel of the kingdom would be preached in all the world for a witness and then the end would come. The gospel is good news. That means good news. And we need to be, we need to be equipped, we need to be enabled, we need to be empowered to share the gospel with people. Can I be honest and transparent and very transparent with you and say the Holy Spirit has convicted me about personally witnessing to people? about personally sharing Jesus Christ with people. Again, we can talk about anything. It's easy to talk about anything, but you come in contact with somebody who's blind, spiritually blind and can't see, and we have the answer for their blindness, and we can't even open our mouth and share the answer with them. Holy Spirit, empower us. Holy Spirit, enable us to go and make an impact in this world like the disciples made. We were created for divine revelation that others might see. And my last point, point number four, use every opportunity. Verse four, Jesus said, I must work. The King James and New King James are the only two versions that use the word I. Every other version uses the word we. We must work the works of him who sent us while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. I, I, I remember reading this scripture as, as a young Christian many, many years ago. And in my limited understanding, I thought, this must mean it's going to get so bad on this earth one day that we won't be able to do anything for God, so we better do it while the opportunity is good. We better do it before the times get so hard that we can't. I have grown a little bit in the Lord. I've grown a little bit in the understanding of the Scripture now, and I realize Jesus does, that's not what he was saying at all. He was simply saying, remember, Jesus is facing the cross. The cross is just a few days ahead of him. And he has been with these disciples now for three and a half years trying to train them, trying to teach them, trying to get them to open their eyes and see his mission and purpose on this earth. And he's saying, guys, I've got a cross right here ahead of me. I've got a crucifixion that's awaiting me. I've got to work while it's day because my night is coming. My night is going to fall and then I won't be able to. What is he saying? I'm saying whatever opportunity God gives you, take advantage of that opportunity because once that opportunity is gone, it may never come back again. What, who, uh, Leonard Ravenhill, I always get this quote mixed up. He said, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized during the uh, a lifetime of the opportunity. <laughs> the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity, meaning once that opportunity is gone, that door may never open again. I've heard people say, oh, Brother Jerry, if I could just get my help back, I'd serve the Lord. I'd do this, I'd do that. If I just had this, I, I'd... What he's saying is, night is falling on everybody. There will come a time in your life when you're not able to do what you can do right now, so make the most of right now. Make the most of today. Make the most of right now, the life God has given you, the breath in your body, your heart beating. Make the most of it because night will fall and you won't be able to. I shared this story um, in the earlier service. Uh, Jeff Knight, I don't know if that name rings a bell with any of you. Uh, Sister Valera Oliver who was in this church. It's her son-in-law, Jeff and Angie. And Jeff... Uh, <clears throat> Oh, was a dope head. Put it in terminology, we can understand it. He was hooked on drugs, hooked on marijuana. Uh, one of these people you would have never thought, there's, he'll, he'll never be in church, there's no hope for him, just write him off. Uh, he, he was quite the rounder. <laughs> and a 12-year-old girl witnessed to him. 
a 12-year-old girl. <laughs> You're never too young to be used by the Lord. A 12-year-old girl shared the gospel in simple terms with Jeff after he had just come off of a pot run, <laughs> and he accepted the Lord. He was in a Baptist church. And he was working offshore on an oil rig out from the coast of Louisiana. New, newfound Christian, newfound faith, new birth. <laughs> he, he became a Christian. He asked Jesus into his heart. New eyes, new vision. He could see now spiritually. And he goes back to work on this oil rig. <clears throat> and Jeff told me this out of his own mouth. He said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, go witness to Joe, another guy on the oil rig. And Jeff said, I was so uh, scared. He said, I was a new believer. I was a young Christian. He said, and that oil rig was the vilest place on the planet to work. He said, uh, there was pornography on the televisions. There was cursing. There was alcohol. He said, it was just a vile, vile place. He said, and here I am, the only Christian on the rig that I know of. He said, the Holy Spirit spoke very plainly. Go witness to Job. And Jeff said, I just, I wrestled with it. I'm like... God, I don't know scriptures. I, don't, I'm not, I haven't been doing this very long. So the Holy Spirit spoke twice. Go witness to Joe. And Jeff rationalized away all the reasons why he shouldn't do it because he wasn't a seasoned believer. Said the third time the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart. Said I knew it was God speaking to me. And it was almost with a forceful tone. Go witness to Joe. And said he said, I, I just can't. I, I'm just weak. And Jeff said, uh, it was two or three days later, I can't remember, there was a tragedy, the malfunction of equipment on one of those, oil, that oil rig, and Joe was killed on the spot. And Jeff said, I will live with that man's blood on my hands until I go to my grave. He said, because the Holy Spirit specific, specifically spoke to me and said, go witness to him. What am I saying? There was an opportunity right there. There was a window. And that opportunity not fell on that opportunity, and it will never come again. Joe's in eternity, wherever eternity is for Joe. Jesus said, the night's coming. No man can work. i got to do what i got to do right now. How passionate are we about doing what we need to do for God? Do we have spiritual vision enough to see and realize this is not the usual day we're living in. I mean, we're on the heels of a pandemic that has basically shut the world down. That, that's, that's never happened in our lifetime. These are not days as normal. And it doesn't take a, <laughs> a very learned person to realize, man, these are unusual times. If you're ever going to do anything for God, you might want to get busy doing it because night's coming and we may not be able to. We, uh, Cody and I were invited to Dothan to a restaurant last Monday night to go and meet uh, a couple of guys who work with Builders International. Builders International is the construction arm of the Assemblies of God World Missions program. They go in other countries, build churches, build hospitals, build orphanages, uh, they're just the construction arm of the world missions of the Assemblies of God. And uh, we met uh, Ryan Moore, who was over uh, Builders International, and then we met Scott Warren, who was like a chief executive officer um, with uh, Builders International. And Scott was a unique individual. He was, uh, he was from Miami, and he had ran, he had owned the largest travel agency in the United States. He would charter out like 10 uh, big airplanes for NBA, and he would book uh, like nightclubs in Cancun and these just big, big time travel. And he was probably a multimillionaire with this industry and with this business. And he had a close call one night when he was in Miami. Had, it was Thanksgiving. It was a Thanksgiving uh, meal they were set down to, and he thought he was having a heart attack. And he gets uh, ready and goes to the ER, the hospital, one of the hospitals there in Miami. <clears throat> and he says a voice speaks to him. He, he was not raised in church. He was not raised uh, by Christian parents necessarily. And he said a voice speaks to him and says, you've lived your entire life and taken every opportunity the devil has given you. 
now you're going to live for me and use opportunities that I give you. And uh, thank God his attention, as it would get anybody's attention, I guess. And uh, he, uh, he didn't have a heart attack. He was fine. He was dismissed from the hospital. But he, he gave up his travel agency, and he gave up that lifestyle, and he fully committed his heart and life to the Lord, serving him. But he said one thing kept going over in his mind when he was laying there in that hospital bed. And he didn't have any knowledge of the Bible or Scripture. He said, I just thought, man, if I were to have to stand before God right now and give an answer for my life, I couldn't name one thing that I had ever done for God. He said, I couldn't name one opportunity that I had ever used for the Lord. He said, and that just kept hitting me in the face. You're going to answer for your life, and you can't name one thing that you've ever done for God. What are you doing with the opportunities that God has given you? What am I doing with the opportunities God has given to me? He gives us opportunities every day, every week. We pass people that are blind by the side of the road, maybe not physically, but spiritually. And they need someone to take them by the hand and lead them and show them the way. And if the church doesn't do that, nobody will. If the church doesn't do that, it will not get done. We can come in here every week. We can sing our songs. We can sing our choruses. We can feel good about ourselves because we haven't done bad things this week. But that's, that's beside the point. The bottom line is we're supposed to be a light to people that are in darkness and cannot see. Would you bow your heads this morning? Sister Claudia, you want to come to the keyboard? Heavenly Father, we thank you for grace and mercy today. We thank you for the gift of the new birth in Jesus Christ, salvation that we do not deserve and we could never earn. We could never be good enough. We could never work for it. We thank you, Lord, that you suffered and bled and died on the cross that our eyes might be opened and we might truly see and have clear vision today. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit move in our lives, fresh and new. It's just us in here this morning. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want to ask you a very simple question. Are you born again? I know you've had a physical birth. You wouldn't be sitting in this building if you hadn't. But have you had a, the second birth, that new birth, where Jesus Christ comes into your heart, rules in your life, and becomes the Lord of your life? If you're here today and you need Jesus, if you need to give your life to Jesus, if you need to repent of your sins, would you just slip your hand up and put it right back down? I'll not embarrass you. just want to know you're here. God bless you. I see your hand this morning. God bless you. What are you doing with the opportunities the Lord gives you every week to impact his kingdom, to be his hands, to be his feet, to be his voice speaking to somebody's life? If you need prayer for anything, would you just stand right where you are with heads bowed and eyes closed? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.